good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor, my privilege to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to try and talk about a number of things in the 15 minutes that has been given to me. As we talk, the Indian economy is arguably going through a crisis of its kind it hasn't seen for at least two decades, perhaps longer. The world, or large parts of the world, has been through a, a great recession. It's been five years now, and this kind of a recession has certainly not been seen on the planet for at least seven decades. What I'm going to really talk to you about is why are notions of capitalism, socialism, public, private, need to be rethought and reinvented given the state of the world economy and the state of the Indian economy. I'm not going to get into too much theory or philosophy, but try and talk about what's happening across the globe. And after giving you a big picture of what's happening across the globe, let's try and look at what's happening in our own country. You know, the textbook tells you, capitalism says that, you know, each one of us is essentially very selfish. Socialism, communism. What do these words mean in today's day and age? I, I kind of raise half a dozen questions to you, and these questions are rhetorical. I think the answers are fairly obvious. Is the People's Republic of China a communist country or a capitalist country? Is General Motors, once often considered to be epitomizing free enterprise capitalism, is it a public company or is it a private company? Because in the last few years, the bulk of its shares are being held by the government of the United States of America. That is the taxpayer of the US. Are the four countries of Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, are these capitalist countries or socialist countries? Because these countries spent arguably one of the highest proportions of their gross domestic product on healthcare, education. They have the one of the highest tax to GDP ratios. They're one of the few countries in the world where citizens willingly pay more tax and don't, don't look on payment of tax as some sort of an imposition from a government which takes away something that they've earned by giving little or nothing in return. And what kind of economy is that of India? Our first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, wanted us to be a mixed economy. Many believe we ended up becoming a mixed-up economy. We took the worst, worst of capitalism, we took the worst of socialism. Capitalism tells you, you know, you must do something about the, the entrepreneurial spirits of the middle classes. For, for decades on end, we had a license control Raj. The, Animal spirits, the entrepreneurial spirits of large numbers of people were stifled. The, the economy was run by our netas and our babus because they felt that they knew what was best. We took the worst of socialism. Many believe that, you know, Indira Gandhi was a socialist. She, she coined the phrase garibi hatao, but many believe that, you know, she was actually more interested in garib ko hatao, not garibi hatao. You know, even Nehru, he was, with, during his lifetime, his critics said, no, no, you're not a real socialist. You're helping the moneyed people, the, the, the rich and the powerful. And those on the right, the Swatantra Party said, oh, Nehruji, you are actually not doing enough for free enterprise capitalism. So he was attacked on both sides by those on the right and those on the left. 
our notions of right and left too have undergone major changes. But, but when you say that if India was indeed a so-called socialist country, why did we fare worse than the erstwhile Soviet Union, not to mention Vietnam and Cuba, in providing healthcare and education to the majority of our people? So were we socialists or were we so, uh, well, capitalists? Or, or were we so mixed up that we ended up taking not just the worst of both worlds, Today, are we in a position to assimilate best practices from across the globe? Can we assimilate best practices from capitalist countries or so-called capitalist countries and so-called socialist countries? This is the question that I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll raise more questions than provide answers to, because I've always been told that it's only a smart guy who pretends to know all the answers. A wise person knows how to ask the right questions. So I do not know if I'll be able to raise the right questions, but I want you people to think a little bit about our notions of public and private. What was really public about India's public sector? Because it was run by bureaucrats and politicians. It was run like their personal fiefdoms. It was only name public. Similarly, what was private about our private sector? Large companies, large by Indian standards, not by world standards, large companies, the, the, the promoter groups or the promoter families had what, 6%, 8%, 10%, 12% of the shares? Where did the rest of the money come from? From what were then called term loan institutions, financial institutions, banks, the working capital came from them. These were all financial institutions and banks which were controlled by the government, owned by the government. They were public sector. Why, why did very often the, the losses of, of the public sector translate into profits of the private sector? The joke was that one point of time in Tata Steel, which was once known as Tisco, Tata Iron and Steel Company, the Birla family had more shares than the Tata family. So, our notions of public and our notions of private have undergone major changes, especially after the worldwide recession that we are living through. And all I'm trying to argue here, and today two of the best known economists of this country, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and Professor Amartya Sen, they are arguing in what, in what in my opinion is a non-issue. To me, I think it's more personal peak, it's ego battles, because at the end of the day, one person got a Nobel Prize, the other didn't. But yes, of course we need growth. Of course we need inclusiveness. We need growth and redistribution. It's not one versus the other. But why have we done so poorly in both? Yes, India is a unique country, of course, in the world. One out of three computer software engineers on the planet is a person of Indian origin. But so is one out, of poor, one out of three persons on this planet who is poor, who's hungry, who's undernourished, malnourished, illiterate. This is the reality of the world that we live in. The United States of America has barely 4% of the world's population, 300 million out of 7 billion, or roughly there. But the US economy, even after the Great Recession, is still roughly one-fourth of the world economy. Roughly $15 trillion out of $60 trillion. In other words, 4% of the population of the planet consumes roughly a quarter of this planet's resources. India and China put together have roughly 40% of the world's population. On purchasing power parity terms, these two countries account for roughly a fifth of the world's Cross domestic product. Put differently, if every person in India and China started consuming like the average citizen of the United States of America, we'd need two planets Earth, but we only have one. So in a sense, the future of planet Earth depends on whether or not countries like India and China are able to develop in an ecologically and environmentally sustainable manner, in a manner where you have growth with inclusiveness, growth that creates jobs, growth that does not widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots, with the affluent and the underprivileged, 
but actually gives equal opportunities. So am I being excessively idealistic? Am I being excessively naive in thinking that this is possible? No, I don't think so. I think it is indeed possible. So I'll just spend a few minutes in trying to argue why it is possible, which brings me here to this country and this. You know, a few hours ago, the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, talked about why the Indian rupee has like fallen, the precipitous decline in the value of the rupee vis-a-vis -vis the American greenback. Actually, nobody could have anticipated the kind of sudden fall. I mean, from the, the last week of July till now, the value of the rupee to the vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar has crashed by more than a fifth, it's almost a fourth. And w why has this happened? And why are people today saying it was Dr. Manmohan Singh, who was the architect of economic liberalization in 1991, is today in the last year of his second term as prime minister of India, why, why is he today presiding over an economy which seems to have collapsed? Where, where Indian investors are investing more outside India than foreign investors in India. The government stakes its, its very survival to, to attract foreign direct investment in multi-brand retail. But we're still waiting for Walmart to come in. Walmart is waiting for the rules to be tweaked further. Why have we entered into this vicious cycle, this chakra vayu that we are in today? Why is the rupee declining? Because we have a high current account deficit. What is the current account deficit? The difference between inflows and outflows of foreign exchange. Why do we have such a high current account deficit, close to 5% of our GDP? Because we have a high trade deficit. Why do we have a high trade deficit? Because our exports are not going up. What are our exports? Gems and jewelry, polished diamonds, leather products, handicrafts, processed foods, textiles, clothing. Clothing. Well, our markets in the West are are shrinking or in a bad shape. Europe is still going through a double dip recession. There have been a dozen regime changes in Europe in the last five years. Their markets have collapsed completely. M many of uh, our exports are also import intensive, like polished diamonds. So we are not able to leverage the advantage of a lower exchange rate. More importantly, we have not been able to do anything about our imports. Roughly a third, about 40% of our total import bill is oil, crude oil. 80% of our total requirements of crude oil, we import much of it from West Asia. Today we have a crisis in Syria. We are wondering if oil prices will shoot up again, as they did in March 2008 when it touched almost $148 a barrel. So why are we in this vicious cycle? Because after oil, what are we importing? We're importing gold. Why are we importing gold? Because Indians are crazy about yellow metal? Of course they are crazy about Why are they so crazy about yellow metal? What's the difference between 91 and now? Because gold is perceived to be the best hedge against inflation. And the difference between 1991 and now is that we've seen four years, four years of high food inflation. Food inflation has led inflation. It's been more than double digits. Food inflation has not just kick, uh, been two big kicks in the bellies of the underprivileged, it's widened the inequalities, it's widened the gap between the rich and the poor in an already unequal society. I'm not arguing that the rich have become richer and the poor have become poorer, but the poorer, poor certainly haven't become richer as fast as the rich have. So the gap between the rich and the poor has widened. That's the reason for the social inequality, the tensions that we see in Indian society today. Now, why that vicious cycle? High current account deficit, high oil imports, high diesel prices, high prices of every single product, people invest in gold, current account deficit goes up, low growth, little employment, and hello, we are in this mess. And very few people really believe that we are going to get out of this mess in a hurry. That this is going to be a long, drawn out, painful process. As in 1991, very, very difficult decisions will have to be taken, except that ideologically, I don't know where, it's, where, we, go, where we are going 
and whether how whether we'll be able to truly emulate best practices best best practices from across the globe and not take the worst of all worlds but let me tell you and these would be really in the form of concluding remarks why i am an optimist why i believe my children will live in a better india than the india in which i lived or the india in which my parents lived why because we are the world's largest democracy of course are we the world's best democracy not yet but we have to get there sooner than sooner than later people forget we are going to have the 16th general elections in the last 15 general elections we've had on seven occasions the regime has changed there's been a peaceful change in government we've entered a new era of coalition politics the two largest political parties in the country minus their coalition partners have barely half get barely half the vote yes we have 1.2 billion people 800 million people are eligible to vote roughly 60% of those eligible to vote actually vote and half of those who vote vote for either the congress or the bjp put differently half of those who vote don't for e don't vote for either the congress or the bjp they may vote for some of the coalition partners the upa and the nda have imploded today let me put it to you differently we have 28 states in india seven union territories in only eight out of the 28 states is the real political battle between the congress and the bjp the two largest political parties in the country in 20 out of 28 states there's at least one other major political player there are four large states uttar pradesh bihar bengal tamil, tamil nadu where the two largest political parties have been pushed to the margins so why am i optimistic about the future of india's polity why am i optimistic that this country has a great future even if in the short term things appear totally chaotic of course why are we in this chaotic state because of the arrogance of those of or those who are in positions of power and authority and it's not just arrogance it's arrogance coupled with stupidity what a disastrous combination an arrogant man who's also stupid vinash kale viprit buddhi ho jate hain logo ko example 1 the day the government decided to put anna hazare behind bars in tehsihar jail you know a high school student would tell you that you'll make him a martyr a larger than life character then you put him behind bars and then you said it's the delhi police who've done it i mean who were you fooling i mean everybody knows who's who's the boss of the delhi police chief there was a young woman who was gang raped in delhi in december there were a bunch of students who were lighting candles in india gate they went about to storm the rashtrapati bhavan our great netas and our babus decided to turn the water cannons on them and the arrogance was coupled with stupidity they closed eight metro stations around literally daring the students to walk that extra mile and the 42 year old great white hope of the indian national congress was no way to be found during that period example number 3 the supreme court of india tells the central bureau of investigation you know don't show this investigation report to the people who are your accused persons who are suspected they go ahead and do that what happens the law minister loses his job the cbi chief after being told he's a caged parrot said no no this caged parrot can squawk and before you know it the railway minister has put in his papers but why am i optimistic i mean it's so easy to be so gloomy about the state of the economy the state of the polity to be cynical and said oh we are in a mess no in the last five general elections 40% of our members of parliament some honorable some not so honorable were not reelected that's what makes me optimistic the anti incumbency sentiment many people say that this is not such a great thing you know once people get elected they become greedy in 5 years they want to make as much money as quickly as possible so this whole anti incumbency sentiment is actually encouraging corruption and venality Pe people are so cynical i mean why build a road for your constituents you know to village a because then village b will not vote for you right so why build a road in the first place you know sit back may get your cronies uh, all the contracts live ha ha heavily live happily ever after make sure 14 generations after you live happily ever after of the fat of the land no no i'm sorry i'm not so cynical 
I do believe ordinary people in this country have relatively small or relatively modest expectations from their elected representative. I do believe, I do believe that they say, okay, that look, if you do something, a little bit, just listen to people, listen to their aspirations, listen to their problems, that's what they expect you to do. Build that road, make sure that, that school building, that, that, that roof has been repaired, make sure there's some medicines in the primary health center. You might improve your chance of getting reelected. That's what makes me optimistic, that 40% of our elected representative, or sometimes it's 50%, don't get elected. And I see the anger and the outrage in ordinary people, anger that our natural resources, whether it be telecom spectrum, whether it be coal, whether it be gas, whether it be iron ore, they've been looted, absolutely looted. You are supposed to have here a government which is supposed to be a custodian, a trustee of resources that belong to the people of the country. What do they do when, you know, you have in, in the name uh, of, you know, helping the country, you allow a few people to make huge windfall profits. So I, I think India is changing. The anger of our youth, we keep talking about the demographic dividend. The anger of ordinary people, the outrage of the ordinary citizen is going to change India in your lifetime and in mine, and in ways that would be good. That's what makes me truly optimistic, you know, that, that we are today living in a world where people are yearning for positive change. And that will happen. I'm truly proud that I live in this country. I'm truly proud that my blood group is B positive. And I'm truly proud that the sun rises in the east. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'll be happy to take your questions. Just, we, we have time for just about one or two questions at the most. Uh, yes. Sir. Sometime, some years back, in Taiwan, to one of the famous economists, I asked a question, <coughs> how social, political, and economic stability can be achieved? And his answer was very specific. His answer was price mechanism. Do you agree? Do you disagree? You know, I really agree with uh, what has been said. I think the biggest problem that we've faced in the last four or five years has been the inability to control prices. You know, I, I think double-digit inflation in a country like India is criminal. You know, I, we don't want to be like Brazil of the 70s or Israel of the 80s when you had triple-digit inflation. But by Indian standards, if you're unable to control the prices of essential items, food and articles of mass consumption, I, I think that is the biggest failure of whoever is in power. And to me, that and job creation should be the two primary goals of whoever's in power. I pretend to be an economist, sir. I studied economics many years ago. But, you know, economists were sometimes compared to the Brahmins of the medieval age. They act, used to act as a gap between the king and the masses because they could, you know, twist figures and juggle statistics. Unfortunately, economists have got a terrible name there are a few good guys among them. You'll, it's a little difficult to find them, but you'll find them if you look very hard. <laughs> Great. Hi, sir. It was quite an impressive speech. Uh, I agree with most of the points. I have this question. You said that it's the stupidity and arrogance of people in power here. You talked about the gang rape. You blamed the law and the government for shutting down metro stations, etc. So don't you think the real problem is the attitude of people here? We are arrogant. We are impatient. We are illiterate. We, we're lacking in intellect. We're lacking in common sense. So the, the anger of the youth that you talk about is so misdirected at, that it's difficult to be optimistic in India. I disagree with you completely, my young lady. I do not believe an educated man is necessarily a good person. There are some highly educated people who have committed some terrible evils across the world. Nor do I believe that a person who's poor, who's underprivileged, is necessarily unintelligent. unintelligent. So I think there's absolutely no relationship between these. I think the problem with our country, and uh, it's not unique to this country, maybe it's there for other countries, is those who are in positions of power and authority. Instead of being humble and intelligent, they are arrogant and stupid. That's the problem. 
to put it in a nutshell. I'm sorry I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation to give you. Uh, those who usually give PowerPoint presentations, I was told, are very powerful people. Uh, sometimes they also have a point to make, I know that. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think a lot of food